Hi guys, Jake here. Um, just wanted to say hi with a few things. Um, first off, it's looking like the uh, the premiere of year two will be a little bit delayed from where I originally wanted it to be. Um, just because real life has been getting in the way. Uh, started up a new job, taking care of other non-Power Rangers related responsibilities, and um, Marissa and I are actually going on a vacation next week to celebrate our eight-year anniversary, so Woohoo on that, but uh, unfortunately that hasn't left a lot of time for working on the show, so I really want to make sure that I have a good solid premiere, so that will probably be released, um, not this weekend, but next weekend, uh, right after we get back. Uh, in the meantime, I figured that now would be a perfect opportunity to talk about something that a lot of people have wanted me to talk about, um, which has been now made particularly relevant uh, with the news that was released uh, last weekend, and that, of course, is Tokume Sentai Go Busters. You see, I got the uh, figure art of Red Buster. Um, my friend Dave, who many of you guys know as Guy slash Agent Y from Power Reviews, went to Japan last year and uh, brought me this back as a souvenir. Much, much nicer guy in person than he is on the show. Still hasn't asked for his camera back. It's kind of awesome. Anywho, uh, so as many of you... No, um, during the hiatus, I decided to check out Tokume Sentai Go Busters, watched all 50 episodes over the course of like four or five days, just powered right through it. Um, as many of you may guess, I did enjoy it. Um, I thought it was good, not great, not fantastic, but very good, uh, and definitely a lot more enjoyable than, uh, than most of the Power Rangers that I've seen over the past couple years. Um... So I'm going to try and just give a broad overview of my thoughts uh, without getting too into the nitty-gritty of the, the details of the show and, the, and, um, and try and keep this uh, pretty nice and concise and true to my personal views regarding it. Um, I will say that it did grab me right from the get-go, uh, which makes me really surprised that a lot of people didn't uh, get invested in the show right from the beginning. Um, I guess different, uh, different tastes, but, um, what really grabbed my attention, actually, was, um, the aesthetics and the mechanics by which this world operates, um, which I thought was, uh, surprisingly, uh, creative and innovative, um, especially in a franchise that has been so, you know, tried and true formula for so many years. Um, right from the get-go, the mech battles in particular grabbed my attention. Um, because, you know, you, you think, you've seen one sort of battle, you've seen them all to a certain extent, but they really did not shy away from some of the brutality that goes into this. Uh, you, you, especially in the early episodes, it becomes lesser as the show goes on, but in, in like the first episode, you just see debris everywhere, and they have the low camera angles, really changing up the cinematography, really giving a sense of, of scope and size, uh, to these, to these battles, um, along with, uh, much improved C use of CG, and very little cutaways, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, everything is sort of... It, it, occurring in real time. They even do make mention at one point to uh, being concerned about um, about the enemies attacking while they're combining their zords. And there's actually one combination that's so big and so massive that they just completely put it together in the hangar and don't ever try, you know, a field combination. And I thought that was really surprising and, and a, a, a fresh very realistic take on the Zord battles, um, so I really like that. Um, there's only uh, six Zords over the course of the series. There's one movie special Zord that pops up at one point, but six core Zords that you, that you get to see um, regularly throughout the series, and they make just such a great use of this limited um, this limited arsenal. Um, all of them have at least two modes. They, they combine in different permutations. You see them working together. You see them working separately. Um, just such a great use of, of what they have. Um, same thing with their, with their arsenal on the ground as well. Each ranger is only given two weapons. Um, 
up until they get a, the, a special weapon a little bit more than halfway through the series. But um, generally speaking, you have a gun that turns into a camera, you have a sword that turns into a set of binoculars, and they combine together into a, a super blaster, a special buster weapon, um, which I think is it was great. It's, it's utilitarian, but it, it's multi, multifunctional, multi-purpose, and that's that's what you get from the feel of uh, of the weapons and the uh, and the aesthetic of this of this team. Uh, a very different aesthetic, as you see. They have the colored sunglasses. Um, the suits are are like leather. Um, very different looking, but very um, very correct for the situation. Uh, you feel like, okay, this is a special ops group designed to take out uh, forces quickly and efficiently. Uh, so that worked very well for me. Uh, and I love the fact the morphing sequence, much like the uh, Zord sequences, but even more so for the morphing sequences and the special finishers, um, were all done in real time. There was no cutaway morph sequence. Um, they, You see the... The uh, suit forms around them, the helmet forms around them, the sunglasses jet off from their from their morphers, and that's how they transform. And they do that in real time, almost almost every time. There were a few stock instances, um, but I found that very refreshing and, and really keeps you um, immersed in the battles. Um, and I, I like the fight choreography very much. Feels like you know, quick, efficient takedowns was sort of their style and, and really worked. Um, combined with the use of civilian powers, uh, which I know is, is not a common uh, trope in Sentai, but was very common in Power Rangers during the Disney era. Um, but their civilian powers can be used while they're morphed as well, which I thought was great, because that was something you never really got to see on Power Rangers. So these are, um, there are things that, you know, you're used to seeing on Power Rangers, but you get to see used in different ways, uh, and to different extents that you didn't get to, don't necessarily get to see before. Um... So, you know, you get the, and uh, later on they get power-ups that allow them to charge up these powers even more, and in, in really creative ways, I thought. I, I, I really liked the way they use their powers, the way they use their weapons, the way they use their swords. Um, I, I thought that was fantastic. Um, another thing that was really revolutionary, I thought, was the way that the villains operated. Um, you have a very small group of villains. You have the, the Big Bad, which is a computer virus that, that lives in this um, sort of hyperspace, subspace zone that he's trapped away in and trying to get out. Um, so he sends, um, he sends his representatives into the real world uh, to fight for him. And the main villain throughout most of this is his, um, is his initial messenger named Enter, uh, who's just a great, great villain. Um, he starts off very charismatic, very playful, um, you know, just, just wanting to mess with people. He's extremely proficient in combat, but never sticks around long enough to really suffer a, a solid defeat. Uh, he, he knows when to get out uh, and when to do damage, um, and uh, has, has some great, uh, you know, bits of nuance to his character, like the I, I like the, the little bits of French he would drop out of nowhere just for no reason. He, he just likes to use French phrases. And then you eventually find out that it is, there is a reason for it. And I won't get into spoilers here. I'm just giving a very broad overview of my thoughts. Um, but I thought that was a fun little gimmick for him. And he, he really develops over the course of the series from um, playful to frustration to... You see jealousy of of being overshadowed. You see him deal with his first real solid defeat, and it changes him so dramatically and changes his drive and his motivations. And you see him grow from um, this completely unknown. Uh, you know, presumably the when the characters first meet him, they just assume that he's just a random robotic thief. Uh, and by the end of the series, he's just developed into so much more. Um, 
into, into such a, a, a powerful force uh, against the Rangers. And um, there's, there's a moment in the second to last episode towards the very end where you just... He, uh, he, he busts something out towards the end, and it's, uh, toward, toward, towards his second to last episode, and it just kind of gives you chills, um, because he, he takes, uh, a trope that we've seen plenty of times before, but, um, but really has a sense of menace to it, uh, and I, I won't get into too many details on that. Um, I like that the show did not shy away from some, um, harsh, uh, themes. I thought that was very interesting. The, um, the Rangers themselves are very much driven by a traumatic event from their childhood, um, that they all deal with in different ways because there is actually a notable age gap, uh, between the Rangers. Um, their ages are 16, 20, and 28, so, uh, during the traumatic event 13 years prior, they were very different ages and deal with them in very different ways. Um, so that created a very interesting dynamic. But that traumatic event really drives them throughout a, a large chunk of the series, and about 60% through, they're, they're met with a incredibly difficult choice, and the, um, the show doesn't shy away from them making a, a, a very hard choice and making what ends up being the right choice for them. And you keep thinking that, you know, okay, this is, the, you know, maybe the, the, maybe these consequences can be reversed, but no, they do stand by, the, the writers stand by the, um, the choices that the characters make, which I thought was a, something of a bold decision. Um, and a question that's repeatedly raised throughout the show is sort of, what about when this is all over? Um, which you never really hear, um, in Power Rangers and Sentai, but there was a large amount of focus for, for the Rangers, you know, when this battle is done, when we have finally, you know, have done what we have set out to do, what then? And there are several points throughout the series where they think that, they, that they're that they done, that they've won, that, you know, it is over, and they're not quite sure what what's going to come next, and they almost leap back into the opportunity to be back in the battle. Um, and, and I thought that that was very interesting. Um, so by the end, by the, you, you've, you know, been, you feel like you've been faked out all these times, and when they finally, obviously, at, you know, the series ends, the heroes have won, you feel like, they had to work for it, they really did. Um, and they deserve whatever life, uh, shows them afterwards. And, and that's going to be, you know, the next big adventure for them. Um, so I thought that that was, the, those themes were very interesting. Um, as, as far as, uh, flaws in the series, because, you know, it, it was not a perfect show. Um, I felt like... The characters themselves could have been a little bit more well-rounded and, and a little bit more um, developed in different ways. Um, and and the story at times does move a little slowly. Uh, it is, to a certain extent, always moving forward, but it's, a, it's in bits and pieces, and that pacing can, I understand, be frustrating for viewers. Um, since I watched over the course of about a week, obviously that wasn't a big problem for me, but I could definitely see it a big problem see it being a problem for uh, viewers who are only watching it once a week. Um, but, uh, yeah, the characters did feel a little bit dry. I, they, they were all, uh, the Rangers themselves were all multifaceted. Uh, they each had flaws. They each had dynamics with the other characters. Um, you know, defining trait, uh, defining weakness, defining arc, you know, defined level of growth. But you, you did, to a certain extent, want to see just a, a slightly different side to them that very often you didn't really get to see. Um, and, you know, that, that was something I would have liked to see more of. I especially would have liked to, see, to have seen better development uh, in the supporting cast, uh, specifically the commander, Kuroki, uh, as well as his two sub subordinates, um, 
Nakamura and, uh, and Morishita. I think I'm pronouncing those right. I don't speak Japanese. But, um, but especially the commander felt like he had a lot of backstory, especially with, um, with Jin, who was introduced, um, about 15 episodes into the show as, uh, as Beat Buster, um, our fourth, uh, Go Buster, who's joined by his, uh, his buddy Royd, uh, Beat J. Stag, who is, uh, who is, um, Stag Buster. So they're, they're basically our gold and silver rangers who join in, uh, to, to round out our five-man band. Um, but he, he has a, a level of history with the commander that I felt could have been better explored, as well as the commander's relationship with the parents of the, uh, of the characters, I felt could have been better explored. As well as some of the origins of, um, of this world in which they operate. Um, everything seems very much revolving around this uh, clean energy source called Enetron, giant towers that dominate the city, and they're frequent target of enemy attacks. The enemies want the energy so that they can restore uh, Messiah, the big bad, to bring him into our world. Um, and I felt like there was going to be more of a story behind Enetrod, uh, more of a story behind what happened in the past, and I felt like um, like that was a missed opportunity. So, so as, as far as the flaws in the show, Really, it wasn't so much um, things that I felt the show did wrong, but um, missed opportunities that uh, led to the experience not being quite as rich as I thought it could be. Um, but you know what? There was still a lot there to really enjoy. Um, as far as the uh, the Rangers themselves, we obviously have you know we have red, blue, and yellow uh, as our core Rangers. Hiromu. Uh, Ryuji, Blue, and, uh, and Yoko is the Yellow Ranger. Um, and they have their partners known as the Buddy Roids, um, who are all these, uh, these robotic partners that have basically been with them since childhood. And so there's an interesting dynamic there. Um, I, I will admit, although I, I felt like the, uh, the characters could have been a little bit more well-rounded, um, they did have some interesting dynamics. The, the dynamics were all very defined, and I felt it could have been a little bit more nuanced in some respects. But they all had very good dy they they all had very uh, well defined dynamics. Um, the buddy roids themselves um, were definitely a source of comedic relief, especially um, Jin's buddy roid beat J Stag Stag Buster, which. I thought it was interesting the fact that they decided to make one of the buddy roids into um, into a go-buster himself, um, and they had some some I thought interesting reasons for how that operated. Uh, it ties very much into Beat Buster's story, which um, I'm not going to spoil. But his backstory ends up being much like the others, very tragic, very much surrounded about around the event, and. You know, very much, um, he also ends up having to make a, a, a rough choice. Um, and to a certain extent, you realize they don't really have money, much choice at all. This is what needs to be done. These sacrifices need to be made in order for them to achieve victory. Um, and I thought that that was, you know, a very realistic take on things. Um... And that was, that was something as a whole that I really liked about the show, the very realistic take on things. Um, the, for instance, the, the Zord hangers, you have just dozens and dozens of engineers working on these Zords around the clock, um, and that you know set, adds that same sense of scale and scope and realism that I was talking about earlier with the Zord battles. Um, you feel like these people are really working hard, and that it takes, you know, it takes a lot of work to protect the city. Um, so you see all these people working so hard, it really plays up the, uh, the threat of these villains um, who have their own really interesting dynamic, uh, especially in the way that they actually release their monsters of the day. It's, it's very different from past series in that um, you have, as I mentioned before, Enter, very interesting villain, uh, will infect some random, seemingly random object 
with uh, with the metavirus, and that turns into a into a metaroid or a metalloid, depending on your translation. Um, and they just they do such interesting things with these seemingly innocuous items. Um, you know, you, like something as simple as you know a uh, an eraser ends up wiping out com their computer data so they can't combine, or um, or so that they can't combine their swords. Or you have um, a, a film projector that traps them in these tragic, like, Lotus Eater machine type illusions um, that force them to, to try, that try and trap them in happiness uh, and, and breaking through is just so tragic for them. Um, so, so the use of the monsters I thought was great, and one of the things that they did very differently instead of the monster growth was each metalloid, or metaroid, um, is linked to a giant robot, which, um, obviously in reference to Power Rangers, is called a Megazord. Um, which I, I did think was a nice nod. Also, their, uh, their morphing call was, uh, their, their, mor their morphin, they, their morpher was called a morphin brace. And, uh, when they activate it, it says, it's morphin time, and they call out, call out Lex Morphin to morph. So that, that's a fun little nod to the show that I'm sure most of you are probably already aware of. Um, but the way the Megazords work is they have, at first, only three, but, uh, but later more variations, Alpha, Beta, Gamma. Um, and each Megazord that's summoned is linked to a metaro uh, Metaroid and has some traits surrounding that Metaroid. So there's one that's made out of a pizza cutter. And so that one has a giant blade that can be used to slice open the Enatron towers so they can get at the uh, energy inside. You have one that's a magnet that tries and sucks it out. Um, so the all these variations on the, these these three main forms, uh, just with their different weaponry. Um, they even managed to make cotton candy intimidating. That's weird. Kind of awesome. Um... And, and very creative. And because the uh, the Metaroids are linked to these Megazords, um, there's, a, there's a certain time frame. They, they take their uh, approach to teleportation very seriously here. It, it takes a, a large amount of energy for teleportation to be achieved, especially between our world and hyperspace, where the villains reside, and where they manufacture all these Megazords. Um, so there's often a timer between the arrival of a Metaloid and the arrival of the Megazord. Because the moment that the metalloid arrives here, it acts as an anchor point, and there's a countdown. And the Rangers need to def the uh, Go Busters need to defeat the metalloid before the Megazord arrives, or else they need to fight a battle on two fronts, um, which I thought was great and really added to the variety of the battles. Because you can have you know two Rangers fighting a met uh, metal uh, metalloid down on the ground, while the other three are up fighting the Megazord protecting the Anatron Towers, and all these different permutations in between. So you get every, uh, all the Rangers partner up in different ways, use their powers together in different ways, use their resorts together in different ways. So very dynamic battles. Um, and I keep coming back to the battles because that, that, that was a really uh, great aspect of the show, I thought, uh, the way they handled that. So, um, oh, and there there is one other character that I, I do feel the need to, to bring up, and that is Escape, uh, who is a, a female counterpart to Enter, who appears um, almost halfway through the series. Very fun, uh, l just total psychopath, loves fighting, and um, is unquaveringly loyal uh, to her master, Messiah. And you see also how she changes as well. Um, react and how she is changed by the, the, the major defeat the villains uh, suffer about 30 episodes in. Um, and she ends up becoming a, a, a shockingly tragic character by the end. Um, very, very inter interesting in what happens to her. And at the same time, it, cr it creates all these, these strange... Um, I don't really want to give it away, but... Enter's a crazy dude, I'll put it that way. Um, so, uh, so that's 
that's, uh, a, a, I think, a pretty good overview of uh, my thoughts regarding the, the themes and the aesthetics of the show, the strengths, its weaknesses. Um, I had very, there were very few episodes that I outright didn't like. Um, there were definitely episodes I liked better than others, um, largely depending on the, uh, the, the action related, related and the, and the stakes of the battle. Um, they, there's an arc early on regarding a, a, a new Megazord being developed that I felt, um, probably could have been paced a little quicker, but, you know, they, they do, um, it does show a lot of, uh, a lot of traits of the characters, uh, end up showing through as they're trying to do this. Really, that's, that's an arc where it's really more so the journey than the final destination. Um, and the final arc, they do end up pulling out some, some really interesting twists and really tying a lot of things together in the end. Um, but, I, but the show is very much divided uh, by that major event about 30 episodes in. Um, and one of the things that's probably the most frustrating thing in the series is that that's followed up by a team-up with, uh, with a character known as Gavon, who was having a movie at the time. Uh, that's probably my, my least favorite pair of episodes. Just not a big fan of Gavon, not a big fan of Shelly or Cherry or however her name's pronounced. Uh, the actress played Kodaha in Shinkanger. She's cool, but uh, the, the actual characters I didn't like. and So that, that kind of soured me on the team up a bit. Um, but apart from that, enjoyable series. I would have liked to see uh, more of these characters and their world and have them be a little bit more fleshed out, but the themes that they had tackled and the aesthetics that they used and um, the the dynamic battles make it very much worth a watch, uh, I think, absolutely. Um, if you're looking for something a little bit more fast-paced and lighthearted, um, you'll probably want to look for something else, but if you can... Uh, if, if you like a bit more serious-minded stories with some goofy elements tossed in. I, I almost forgot to mention that. There are some very goofy elements here. The Buddy Roids are very goofy. BJ Stag is comically serious all the time, kind of awesome. Um, and there is some weird wackiness with the Rangers' weak points. Ryuji's is very dramatic in that he, he uh, overheats when he uses his, his super strength too often. Yoko's is a little silly if she uses, she's, doesn't eat candy all the time, she passes out, she's basically hypoglycemic. Hiromu has super speed, which I think is cool, but apparently freezes every time he sees a chicken. I'm telling you that right now. That's something that appears from the first episode. You don't really know what the deal is from the first episode, you get to understand it later on, but there isn't really any underlying, you're like, oh, this is serious, blah, 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 blah. He just freezes when he sees chickens. That's his particular quirk. Um, so if that sort of thing doesn't bother you and doesn't take you out of the generally realistic nature with which everything is treated, um, I think you have a really um, you have a really good show here. Um, so yeah, th that's my thought on Go Busters. Um, I hope that uh, I hope you guys enjoyed my ramblings. Um, and I hope that you will enjoy year two when it, uh, when Power Reviews returns later this month. Um, till then, uh, Buster's ready go. Let's be logging. Um, <laughs> and, uh, until next time, as always, let the power protect you.